I would like to invite Roger Hirons, and he's going to present his idea about blind burial. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, and I'd like to say thanks to, uh, to Denek. That was wonderful. And also uh, thanks to, uh, to Eli for hosting this, um, this, unusual, this unusual project. And I suppose, actually, um, it becomes very sort of difficult to, uh, to pinpoint the exact significance of the event or the significance of this moment in terms of um, the action of burying an aircraft under the ground. And I think actually the things that sort of interest me at the moment or the things that I've always sort of gravitated towards um, when making artworks or thinking about artworks is, is to think about sort of the, um, the quantity of significance, the idea that we can actually sort of try and um, try and excavate the idea of significance in the present world. Try to understand where significance and meaning might, um, might hold itself. And then paired with that, there is a sort of another idea or another sort of fascination which is to do with behavior. Um, I would always say to students, if I was teaching or lecturing, that it would be really interesting if we were to think about uh, a continuation of art making, a continuation of thinking about art, which was actually more to think about um, instead of object making and painting, perhaps, the traditional methods, that actually maybe in the studio that we were actually thinking about behavior, about the sort of the, the proposal of unanticipated new forms of behavior. And the reason why I say this, and the reason why I find this is an interesting sort of perspective, is that, um, that it proposes the fact that we're opening up the possibility of a space into the future that actually instead of sort of holding ourselves into uh, a kind of stasis, a kind of a present day, kind of endless presentness through the objects and through the, uh, the power that those objects have over us, that it might be interesting and it might be um, kind of exciting perhaps to actually propose unanticipated types of behavior. And so this leads to a type of art making, this leads to a sort of a fascinating kind of conversation with the, with the world and uh, the worldliness of objects. Another thing which also fascinates me about objects is about power. Um, when you put an object in a room, one of the earliest kind of conversations you would have with your, with your students or with your teacher would be that if you put an object in a room, there is a relationship and that power, a, a, a relationship of power is, um, is entertained, is begun. And so when you see an object in a room, which is a sculpture, there is a, a power relationship which is, which is occurring. And for me personally, I find that there's something fascinating about the idea that we have these powerful objects, but they are now discarded. That these objects, like the MiG-21, which is a remarkable object. It was really at the cutting edge of, of technology and development. There was a sense of pro uh, progress and progressiveness, completely imbued by the aesthetics, but also the, um, the functionality of this particular object. And so in a way, this object retains that sort of uh, critical mass of, of, uh, of progress within the body of the object, somehow. And so it becomes this piece of discarded power. It becomes a piece of power that you can pick up that's left lying in the street, and that somehow, as, a, as somebody who hasn't uh, been part of the, uh, the conversation in, 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 um, in the utilization of that power, so you're not like a governmental person, or you're not someone from the military, you're just a person who can look at the world, look at the discarded pieces, and somehow think about what that future of that next, or the next stage of what that object could be. And so for me personally, there is a sort of a thought that the next stage of airplanes, or the next stage of flight perhaps, is to, uh, is to put uh, the aircraft under the ground. That actually that the conclusive part of an aircraft's existence is perhaps the next stage is to, uh, is, is to just simply turn it into the ground. And so the MiG is sort of following a, a sort of a process which has already been in, uh, uh, started. So for instance, um, I propose, the artist always proposes, but the endless proposal of the burial of aircraft in different contexts and different places has been, it's been something that I've been talking about for a number of years. And so you would have, um, for instance, a conversation with um, um, a family in Abuja at the moment who are talking about the possibility of putting a craft under the ground because a family member would, might have an aircraft and an airstrip. And so the conversation becomes about uh, the reasoning why they would put this plane under the ground. It wouldn't be because it's art. It would be because it was a practical con uh, idea. 
And it's so, in a way, I'm sort of offering a kind of a permission, a kind of an idea, and, and that they can utilize it for themselves. And so that they would like to talk about this particular idea as a kind of a, a religious space, um, a, a, a potential for a church to focus a kind of a religious kind of idea um, in a way which is very different, a different type of architecture. And so, again, there is a sort of an influencing on the, on the future possibilities of behavior by just simply suggesting certain types of idea. And I think that the continuation of this idea fascinates me. I think that there is something really fascinating about the idea of, of, of different people from different parts of the world, in different contexts, bearing planes for different reasons. Um, it, it would always be a different kind of context. Recently, there was a, a plane buried in, in Suffolk, um, to the west of England. And it was a very personal and very private uh, burial. It seemed almost like a continuation of a, an artist's studio work. So in a way, it wasn't an event where people were present. It was just simply um, an agreement between um, a farmer, and it was an agreement between a man who supplied me with aircraft parts. And he, he had an aircraft, he had it lying around for many, many years, and he had nothing to do with it. He didn't want this plane anymore, he just found it. Um, he, he knew that he wasn't going to sell it, and it was an ex-military aircraft, a passenger aircraft. And so between the agreement between the seller of the aircraft, between the, the farmer and myself, we sort of decided on a, on a Wednesday afternoon to bury the plane in, in one of his fields. And so on a beautiful kind of Easter, after, um, Easter um, afternoon, we, he dug a hole, took him about a day, and his friend, who had a, had a crane, picked up the plane and it slowly went into the ground. For the next couple of hours, he put the soil back. And so in a way, what was happening was something which was, hadn't been an, an anticipated somehow, hadn't really been experienced um, as a deliberate act somehow. And there was a feeling of a, of a sort of a sense of melancholia, a sense of anticlimax. There was a deep fascination with the aspect of playing, playing, uh, burying the plane, but actually there is a sort of slowness to the process. There is a sort of a self-reflection, <laughs> which was kind of interesting with the work. And one thing I would also say, which actually I find fascinating, is between the movement of idea towards mood. The idea when an idea becomes, or the moment when an idea becomes um, something more emotional, something more tied to the modular idea of, uh, the modulation of, of mood to some degree. And so this started out as an idea. It started out as the, the experience of an idea, and then the experience of it then turned into a set of a group of emotions which were really quite striking and quite unusual. People who were, <laughs> people who were photographing and filming. Um, after the event, we went to a cafe near a lake. It's a very beautiful piece of, um, part of the world. And, um, and what became really fascinating was is that around the table, a group of photographers started talking about their relationships to their fathers. <laughs> or they started talking about, um, you know, emotional kind of, rather sort of melancholy emotional subjects. And so there was something really fascinating about the fact that their mood had been somehow captured within the process of bearing aircraft. So through a technological kind of ob object, through the action of burying, there suddenly became this idea about um, a kind of a grasping or an attuneness of the emotions and a kind of a grasping of the humanness of the human somehow. It just seemed that they become slightly more attuned to their, um, to their environment and to who they might be. Kind of a process of reflection. And so in a way, I wouldn't say that this, it, it's very difficult to describe this process which is just about to happen. Because in a way, it's, it feels like the beginning of a process rather than like the ending of a process. The MiG fighter had a life that we all know. It had a sort of a life that it was completely designed for. It was designed, you know, as a defender and as an aggressor, and it was a, a really remarkable piece of technology which became very influential. But the next stage is to put this piece of technology into the ground next to a, a really quite specific and quite significant um, technological um, facility like the Eli Beamlines. And so that becomes, Eli becomes part of this composition somehow, becomes part of the subject matter of the work. 
And so we put the plane in the ground, we watch the soil piling on top of the plane. And so what happens? What, what then is the next process? It's always going to be present. We don't have to draw attention to it through a kind of a plaque, or we don't have to draw attention to it through, um, I don't know, we don't have to draw attention to it physically. We just need to maybe remember that it happened and that actually we, we kind of, you know, somehow we, we witnessed a, this event, but there is no particular explanation which is more satisfying than any other. There is kind of a residue of memory. Maybe that there will be a mood of some kind, which is also residual, you know, something that will be kind of something in the plane, you know, in the back of your mind that will continue. But there is a kind of a subtlety to this, which I think is really interesting and important to kind of underline that it isn't really a spectacle, it's just a process of being present in the world and that a new perspective is then being maybe um, drawn onto or drawn attention to. And that becomes sort of fascinating for me because obviously the, 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 uh, as a self-definition, the, the idea of an artist is to, is to try and remain attuned, to try and sort of um, become present in the world, to try and watch the world somehow, but also to try and participate in the world, to try and nudge things, perhaps to, uh, to comment sometimes, but also to influence. And so you have all of these sort of possibilities. And so this for me is a, maybe some kind of way of, of kind of nudging a, a kind of idea of, of progress. And I think that with progress, there is ambiguity. And, and one, of my, <laughs> one of the earlier things that I used to say or enjoyed, like, um, enjoyed saying was is that one of the materials that I work with is, is, is ambiguity. That, um, that there is a sort of a fascination with moving towards progress or moving towards the future, but actually not knowing what that future might represent or maybe what it might, um, what, what it might hold. And I think actually with the Eli, that's something that really fascinates me too. That actually that, you know, these are a group of, um, significant um, experiments, significant sort of diagnostics of the future of materiality, a future of sort of substance, and that actually we're moving towards, we're at the kind of the bleeding edge of moving towards uh, a kind of um, future through the interpretation of the materials that happen here. And so in a way that, you know, I, I would like to see that there was a kind of a parallel between sort of the proposal of a, of a, of a kind of next stage, next to a facility which is, again, at the, probably the front end of significance in the, in the modern world. You know, science and progress, you know, this place is probably the equivalent of the church or the philo you know, school of philosophy. You know, these, this is where the front line of, of a kind of a progress into the future might be. And so it becomes sort of a fascinating kind of area to, 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 uh, to perform a work like this. Okay, so there's a little bit of con context. I probably haven't explained a great deal, but I've kind of talked around it as much as I can. But it becomes really, oh, it, it, and, and I'd also what I tend to do as well is if, if you want to ask, ask questions and, and try and influence the way that I speak, then that would be great because it's always good to, uh, to change the subject. I can talk a little bit more about the context of the work from the past as well. I recently did a show at, um, at Rudolfinum uh, a couple of years ago. And so that was a sort of an interesting show, it sort of was explaining a certain group of works that had happened over a number of years. And so for me, the, the, the practice of ritualization is something which I find really fascinating. I suppose living in the UK, um, we, we, um, there was a recent piece of, of, something recently reported, a piece of kind of analysis of our own society, which was to suggest that religion itself was at the point where it was 50-50, that half the country were atheists and half the country believed in, in, a, in a type of religion. And so this was, a, was, a, was a, a new point. This was a new point in our society where actually it seemed to suggest that actually the movement towards um, atheism and non-belief was actually part of, becoming part of the, um, the majority of, of, of the population. And through that, I found that really quite fascinating. I found that sort of really fascinating in so much that having grown up in a rather religious kind of circumstance, being not religious, but having grown up in a religious circumstance, I was very much imbued and very much steeped in the ideas of um, tradition and also ritual. And how those rituals affected and became part of the, uh, the substance of people's lives. How they found their own sense of identity through ritualistic behavior. <clears throat> 
And so I suppose in a way to think about sort of the burial of aircraft, for instance, or maybe the atomization, another work that I've made is the atomization of, of a jet engine into a dust. Another work which was um, sort of commissioned by, um, um, by Venice Biennale was um, a, a work where the altar stone from a decommissioned church had been turned into a dust and that somebody occupied this dust. And so it became this idea about sort of wanting to shift the materiality of the surface of the world somehow, that actually with it we'd established our own society through the myths and the, I guess, the, um, the, the, um, the power of the object somehow, that we're kept in place by certain aesthetic decisions. And that actually the next stage is to sort of personally decommission these objects, is to look at each of these objects which might be sort of maybe committing their own influence and power on and the way that we potentially want to behave as humans, um, how we can liberate ourselves perhaps or emancipate ourselves from the idea of the objects that we surround ourselves by through the tradition of those objects that keep us in place, that perhaps that we can sort of take some kind of um, action towards the object. And, and sometimes I would say that I can insult objects, for instance, and so maybe taking an object and, and translating it or, or uh, uh, translating it into, a, into another form, perhaps, is a, is a type of insult to the original intention of that object. And so I think that something is... I find it very fascinating because I think, in a way, the 1950s was a, a great period of optimistic and... Um, I guess, in a way, there was a sort of future... Uh, there was a futurism to that period. There was the space age, and we were, we were all together on that sort of decision. You know, I think the world was kind of united in a way that saw that there was some kind of usefulness within this, that there was some kind of optimism, there was some kind of idea about adventure within the, uh, the technological decisions made at that point. And I think in a way that we still have those residues of optimism when it comes to the technological future somehow. But there is also sort of an erosion of that sort of idea too. And I think, in a way, I think that it becomes really fascinating that if you somehow invest yourself into the, into the, uh, the objects that remain, the sort of the history of the objects that remain, that it actually can be that you can retain some kind of quest, you, know, you can become part of the, the conversation again, you can become part of the co conversation about progress um, as, a, as, a, as a collective idea, rather than as an elitist idea, perhaps. Nothing wrong with elitism, by the way. And so it becomes sort of really fascinating. Um, anyway, I'm kind of rambling on now. <laughs> so if there's any questions. Okay. Thank you for explaining those feelings and moods and you, you had first time. Uh, is there any message that we can use uh, for an answer? because uh, people that didn't have the chance to, to meet you at this uh, performance, uh, do, do we can use some short message to, to them, uh, like medical feelings or what? Why, why just put the plane in the ground? So, because anyone here can have some feeling about it, but is there any subject of matter of you that, you, that we can share with them? Well, I suppose when we, when we actually go through the action, so when we think that you know, we're moving from a proposal of an idea to the actual action of, of burial, I think that there are certain changes that happen, changes of state, changes of attitude that will occur. And I think that there, maybe that, that's part of the fascination, is that you can have a kind of a theoretical kind of position to take, but you have to test it. You have to test these ideas. And so actually, I think that I'm as in the dark about maybe what this event is proposing as everybody in this room. I think that actually we're just acting upon the idea. We're acting upon a sort of uh, the possibility that we can act upon ideas, um, which I think is really important to, to retain. And I think that actually there seems to be a significant interest, and there does seem to be significant interest for any other reason, I have no idea why people would want to bury planes, but people do, and it becomes a really fascinating thing. And so in a way, an idea that I might have had, what, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 
um, through conversation, through a way of communication, suddenly becomes a kind of reality. For whatever reason, for whatever contextual or societal reason why we've, we've got ourselves to this position, it seems to be that this point in time seems to be a good time to bury aircraft. And it seems to be that point in time is where we are right now. And I think that that for me is a really interesting kind of position and a really interesting place to be. Um, there are a number of things in the world at this point which are ideas which seem to be a regurgitation of a past somehow. And I think in a way there is a sort of a tyranny of the past towards the present and towards the future. And I think that actually it's important to repropose, always propose things which somehow can come from a place which is not anticipated or not coming from tradition um, or a kind of a I don't know, there was a really sort of interesting, I, I was sort of sitting next to a, um, a man who, um, who worked at Boeing in, and he, he worked in one of the facilities in Seattle. And he would always sort of, during this conversation, he would always say that sort of aircraft design and aircraft, the, the passenger aircraft in particular was about um, evolution, not revolution. That actually that the idea is, is that we don't want to make any huge bold leaps in the idea of making these aircraft because we have learned so much. We have learned so much from the past that actually we just want to incrementally slowly learn towards the future rather than just rip up the book and start again. But then comes along the MiG, for instance. There is this sort of development which kind of happened in a very, very short period of time through a kind of an explosive idea of, of complete new technologies. And so that is the result of that. I'm sure that many, many planes or MiGs, many jet engines through test pilots fell out of the sky. It took a lot of courage and it took a lot of development to get these things to work. But then they did. But they were really pushing at a new boundary. They were really pushing literally at a kind of a new, a new idea. And so I guess in a way when I'm talking about sort of pushing at new boundaries, pushing at new ideas, but also I'm putting a plane in the ground. <laughs> we're all putting a plane in the ground today. It becomes a really fascinating uh, paradox. Um, you know, is this a pessimistic act or is this an act of optimism? And I think actually we're, we're living at a time where we can sort of flicker between pessimism and optimism in the drop of a hat, in, within a split second. And that actually we're just living in this sort of mod, um, <laughs> moderated kind of period where we're just thinking about um, the presentness of the present. That the present is very much part of, it's having a great effect on all of us. And so an escape of this continuous presentness is, for me, I think, a, a really successful kind of idea. <laughs> to try and sort of step out of it. Try and step and unanticipate what the present is. I think one last thing I would say is, is that um, I was teaching in London during the time where a, a number of changes to, um, to, the, to the way that students were, were being were being asked to, for instance, pay for their education in a different way, that there were being, um, that there were being a number of changes which actually fundamentally affected going to university in a way which hadn't happened before. And so what happened was is that they were student riots. There were lots and lots of rioting going on in the streets. Some of it got very much out of hand. They were very young, very hot-headed, and they really wanted to make a point. But after a number of days of of, um, of of uh, protesting, quite sort of um, being present in the street. Um, the first day was shocking and, and, and nobody anticipated it. But the fifth day of protest, it was completely anticipated. So the, the, the actual idea of protest had been completely neutralized by the police. You know, that the idea and the, and the kind of the aesthetics of protest were completely anticipated. So it meant the protest had no, what's the best way of putting it? Because it's anticipated, it has no effect. It's completely neutralized. And so in a way, I guess in a way, there is something really interesting about trying to redesign the idea of protest, perhaps. That there is an idea about trying to find new forms of acting and being present in the world so that it's not anticipated behavior. Because the present is very good at anticipating forms of behavior, even influencing it. And that actually, maybe it would be really interesting if we can just unanticipate it sort of take it back into an individual kind of presentness rather than actually a, um, a way of being um, 
I don't know, neutralized, I guess. Anyway, I'm, I'm turning this into God knows what. And so, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, I think, probably said enough.